I was particularly excited about yeah, Jim's willingness to be like here. Um, you know, and for those of you who don't know him, he is really um, lobbyist extraordinaire for the California Newspaper Publishers Association. Um, and as I told him, my condition on doing this program was his availability to come. Because the one thing I thought none of the rest of us in this room, or very few of us, really have good experience as lobbyists. You know, there's so much that we can do as advocates, but we need to know how to channel our, our efforts in really effective ways. And, and you know, Jim ha comes to us having really pushed very successfully in recent years for two student um, press freedom bills um, that have succeeded. Um, and um, I, what I asked him to do was to offer his insight and give us the chance to ask him questions about um, process. How to plan an attack on this kind of effort that will have the greatest likelihood of success. So Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Kind of lonely up here. Yeah. <laughs> um, you want me to come back? Come on down. Uh, well, uh, I, I guess uh, to begin with, uh, I, I need to tell you a little bit about um, my involvement with this and give you a little bit of background that kind of led me <coughs> to some of the legislation that we've been um, successful with. First of all, my organization, the California Newspaper Publishers Association, made a decision about four years ago as part of its mission to begin to incorporate scholastic press issues into its own mission. Um, the board of directors really saw the value of student press and how it impacted the professional press in California. And so not only did they create this um, very uh, broad mission for the organization, but they began to dedicate resources to fulfill that broad mission. And we created a director, a position of director of uh, student relations uh, on our staff, Joe Wirt, uh, who many of you probably know uh, as a resource for many of the scholastic journalists and advisors in California, and also began dedicating some of the resources toward trying to get legislation passed to strengthen scholastic journalism in the state. And so that is sort of the foundation where I come from. Uh, I work on lots of issues before the legislature, uh, and this has been one of increasing interest and, and um, personally for me, increasing satisfaction as a former advisor uh, and teacher uh, at the secondary level. So it was kind of fun. Um, anyway, uh, California, as, as Mark noted, has a very strong foundation on scholastic press protections and has had that since 1977. <coughs> and even with that in place, as the organization began to look at uh, legislatively strengthening scholastic press um, in California, there was a bit of a discussion among the board of directors as to how, um, especially with the Hosty versus Carter bill back in 2005, um, how that might impact a publisher, because as publishers, they were concerned that they would be supporting legislation that would undermine their ability to control the content of publications, and they were very concerned about that. And um, when we first initiated those discussions, uh, I began to explain to them how it worked at the high school level, that the editors, student editors made determinations that the publisher was actually the, the editorial board or the editors um, with uh, strong advice and consent of the advisor and tried to explain the advisor's role in that process, teaching uh, standards of journalism and the like. And they became more comfortable with that. And that was sort of an omen for me as the legislation started to go through because I had to bring that up again, um, which I'll talk about this afternoon when we started to talk with opponents and, and um, with uh, folks that were concerned about that as well. And so I, I think that one of the first things that's necessary is not only to um, try to educate people about who the publisher is, but what goes into that process. Uh, I, I think that's integral uh, to any legislation where you're going to either try to protect student rights or uh, advisors and hopefully integrate those together. Um, the, the next thing, and we started talking about this probably about a year ago, 
um, uh, Jan Ewell really sort of fomented this. Many of you probably know Jan. Um, she was one of the first defrocked advisors, as she likes to put it, um, who was removed from her position after 20 <coughs> years um, for several of the things that her students published in the newspaper. And um, she began talking to us. She began talking to other groups to try to see where, um, as she put it, the power was and to try to see what could be done to help protect advisors from, from this. And um, her initial contact was with my predecessor, a guy that used to sit in the seat that I sit in now, uh, who started his own First Amendment organization. His name is Terry Frank. And um, Terry came up with a very grandiose plan, including causes of action for advisors that were um, uh, removed, and a whole attorney's fees provision, and all of these things, and began to circulate it. And Jan began to circulate it among um, some of the other potential uh, sponsors of the bill, the California Teachers Association and the like. And when I got the email, I thought, holy crap, if this goes into a bill, it's going to get killed out of committee. Um, there's just no way with that much specificity, and especially with the, the causes of action and the attorney's fees provision, that it would ever get through the process. And so um, at that point, we began to get more involved and, and because I knew that that was a doomed effort. Uh, and so I started to talk to Jan a little bit and said, you know, maybe we should approach this more conceptually at first and then sort of put the meat on the bones um, as we uh, begin to see where some of the allies are. And I said, what we first need to do is we need to identify an author, someone who can introduce this bill in, in the legislature. And um, even if I had wanted to go with a different member of the legislature, Senator Yee would have killed me <laughs> um, because this really is his issue. Um, and I knew right away he was going to be the, the person that would want to do this bill. Uh, and so when I met with Senator Yee and his staff, um, uh, we began to talk about it. Now, Senator Yee, give a little background. You've got his history and, and everything else in your, uh, in your, your booklet there. But um, he, as an educator and as a child psychologist, has a passion for this issue that I have not seen in any other member of the legislature um, for these types of issues. Um, it is something that's just near and dear to his heart, which makes him probably one of the most effective advocates on the issue. Um, not only in the legislature, but you know, out in public as well. Um, he's tenacious. Uh, he's very well prepared. He's got a very capable staff uh, who keeps him very well prepared. And more than anything, he has integrity among all the members of the body both in the assembly, the lower house, and in the Senate, the upper house. Uh, and he's very well respected by both sides of the aisle. And I think that is just a critical um, characteristic for him, uh, for us, and for any legislation. Someone um, who is well prepared and also has the respect of both sides of the aisle. And that, that paid off in spades as the bill started to move through the <coughs> process. Um, once we started to sit down with Senator Yee, we began to identify um, who our potential allies were and who our potential opponents would be. But more importantly, we wanted to identify the critical allies. Who was it that we either needed to have on this bill in support or as a co-sponsor that if they weren't, we needed to at least neutralize their potential opposition in order to have any success at all. And of course, that group in California is the California Teachers Association. They were, they were the group that we identified as being absolutely necessary. And so we began to have talks with them. And uh, the bureaucracy of that organization just never ceases to amaze me. Um, we're fairly nimble with my organization. I've got 35 directors that I deal with, but they give us a lot of flexibility and they give us some, some issues um, with positions that we can sort of take. And so if situations arise, I can deal with it on a fairly quick basis, and I'm sort of used to that. Um, CTA, on the other hand, um, moves at a glacial pace on a good day. <laughs> and... Um, Jan had already contacted them probably six months prior to my 
initial meeting with Senator Yee and his staff in November of last year and kind of try to work up through their process, their legislative process, what they consider and, and you know, the groups have to meet, and committees have to recommend and so forth and so on. And so by the time it was a legislative deadline, we had to introduce a bill, um, we still hadn't heard from CTA, at least through their grassroots or their, their um, uh, educratic level. <laughs> And so I began to contact from the top down. I started to contact their lobbyists, and you know, um, I, I talked to Senator Yee. I said, you know, maybe a, a phone call from you would be helpful. You know, you request their presence on this bill. That may that may speed up the process, and it did. As soon as Senator Yee got on the phone and wanted to talk to their lobbyist, um, things began to move much more quickly. And so once um, they began to consider uh, the, um, the idea, the concept of protecting teachers, uh, then um, uh, we began to move forward. And, and finally, they came on uh, as a supporter at first. And then it took another month to get them on as a co-sponsor. So we had already introduced the bill uh, into the process and they were still not a co-sponsor until we had our first committee hearing in March, um, which was which sort of interesting. Um, the other thing that they were concerned about, and the only reason that they came on board, was when we first introduced the language of the bill, we made it about journalism advisors. Those were the, those were the situations that arose at the secondary level in California where um, all of the retaliation had occurred. And they were concerned about elevating one group of teachers over another. And I knew that that was going to be the case because of some, of, um, some other work that I had done previously on some other legislation. And so we had to broaden the application of the bill to not just teachers, but all employees. Okay? And that had a, a very interesting impact later on um, that I'll get to um, in a few minutes. Some of the other groups, well, Take a step, step back again. Um, one of the other th concerns that I had prior to um, moving forward with the bill was um, making it too broad in its application. And originally, as I mentioned, all of the horror stories in California had occurred at the secondary level. And so we really needed to focus that. And that's where, all the, that's where uh, the compelling uh, interests really were. But in the legislation, when we started to talk to Senator Yee, he wanted to extend it not only to um, community college teachers, but the CSU and the UC as well. And I'm thinking, oh my God, we have all these new opponents, potential opponents now. And um, so as we began to talk about that, I said, you know, this really isn't necessary because there really haven't been any stories, the data uh, that has arisen at either of these uh, levels. And, you know, it's sort of a speculative interest. You're right, this is an aggressive microphone. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, I was concerned about how we were going to deal with that down the line. I, I was very strong in my belief about how to argue the need for the bill because of what had happened at the secondary level, but I was very concerned about this tangential thing. More on that later as well. Um, the other thing that we wanted to um, ensure was where we were going to add the language in the codes. And, and that turned out to be uh, a very important decision. But first, with Terry's language that he had first proposed to Jan, he was planning on changing a part of the ed code that dealt with labor relations with teachers, a collective bargaining uh, portion of the education code in California. And it set forth all the rights that the teachers had. And um, the more I thought about that and the more that Senator Yee uh, and his staff and I talked about it, the more I was convinced that was the absolute wrong place to put what we needed to do. And the reason why is because there, were, there was such a political dynamic that already existed with the school boards association and the administrators and the teachers group that I really didn't want to play into that. I didn't want to bring that dynamic into the process. What, it, what this was really about was protecting student rights. So more logically, we wanted to amend the code that already existed that protected students' rights 
And ultimately, that's what we did. And that also turned out to be a very good decision later on. Um, let's see. Okay, other groups that we brought on board as allies. Um, the, um, once we made the decision to go uh, and, and make it apply to the community college, Cal State, and UC levels, we uh, wanted to involve the faculty associations uh, from all of those uh, entities as well and uh, so they came on board and that was helpful we got the student organizations at all of those levels um, that are um, organized uh, interestingly enough everyone has uh, some sort of special interest in a lobbyist in, in Sacramento <laughs> uh, that way and um, then my, my very good friend at the ACLU said yeah you know we're on board too and I said <laughs> 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 Okay, um, and you know, fortunately, Cisco, um, who is who is my friend, uh, clearly understood what um, why I, why I gave him the timeout sign, and I said, you know, let let's build some momentum first. I want you on board. We need you on board, but let's get some momentum first. Let's get it out of the house of origin, and then you can come on board, and then you can really help us out. And he was very helpful behind the scenes. And, and helping me talk to members and helping me talk to committee consultants. Um, but as far as just the, the overall um, public support, if you will, uh, initially, uh, he gracefully uh, accepted my request um, to, to lay off for a little while. Uh, and that, that also proved to be a, a very interesting um, uh, move. Um, I, I think with regard to the process that it's it's really critical that any legislation that a state has or is contemplating or advocates for student protections have someone who understands the process um, whether it's your state press association or whether it's um, you know anybody that you want to contract with a lobbyist you know, someone has to understand the pressure points. Somebody has to understand politi political dynamics um, of that state. Um, it, I, I just can't imagine uh, success without that. Uh, I, I think that's probably one of the more critical things. Fortunately, as I said, our association is on board. And it mystifies me um, that other state press associations um, haven't stepped up, I guess, um, a, as much. Uh, or in some cases um, are just downright hostile um, to to the idea. You know, Jim, because we don't have a lot of time left, let, let me ask relating to that, um, if the State Press Association, who would be an obvious first choice, isn't supportive, suggestions about where else you would look um, or, you know, who, who would be other obvious choices? I wouldn't give up so easily on the state press associations. Quite frankly, um, I think that just like my publishers needed to be educated on not only the value <coughs> of protecting uh, scholastic press, but um, the how editorial decisions are made uh, at pub student press publications, um, I, I think they just don't understand it. I think they just don't know. And so it, it would be very helpful um, I think to just sit down with them and not, not even in, in the context of maybe even uh, potential legislation but just talking to them about the value that Scholastic Press has for their members and then once you establish that and you know sort of build the trust and the relationship then you can take that to the next level and say hey you know California or you know Kansas or Colorado have these laws that you know are working pretty well you know um, what do you think? We've got three working journalists with the with the two big pubs in, in town, so we know both both the publishers well, and so and then that rolls up to the Colorado Press Association, and so they're really aware of what we do, and so I'm I'm pretty sure that when we decide to go down the advisor protection route, they're they're going to support us too, and all these other. I'm excited about that, but it's about relationships. It's, it is in so many of these things. Like I said, we've got working journalists on my board. Sandy. I think you laid that groundwork with your publishers association. Um, would would you suggest that 
we, that folks might work with you to sort of develop a talking points agenda and then look within their state press associations where, where there might be some synergies of people who have mixed backgrounds so that they might, these people might not even realize they could be advocates because it just, the conversation hasn't come up. Sure. But that that would be a point, but that when you go there, you know, just like you have a law already established, you, you sort of have guidelines of how you can pitch this to the publishers. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I'd be more than happy to. I mean, you've got my contact information in each one of your binders. Um, you can shoot me an email or, or give me a call. Carrie, I think you and I have traded a couple of emails already. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. But just to kind of finish the, the answer to Mark's question, if the State Press Association doesn't come on board, start talking to the publisher of one of the larger newspapers in the state. It's not going to happen without some media support. Um, editorials. I mean, we started targeting newspapers in districts where we knew members would have a tough vote or where um, the incidents occurred, where some of the advisors had been retaliated against. And of course, the newspapers loved the local angle on that. And so not only did they start to buy in, okay, we have a problem, and now the legislature has introduced a potential solution for that problem. Now we have a newspaper that's following the story. And that just proved tremendously uh, helpful on that. And then we started getting editorials, and that started building. And then once some of the weeklies and some of the smaller dailies were picking that up, then we started to um, talk to the editorial boards at the San Francisco Chronicle, the LA Times, Orange County Register, the Union Tribune in San Diego. Uh, and they were very helpful, especially the Orange County Register and the Union Tribune, which are normally pretty strong Republican or Libertarian voices in their communities. And that was very helpful with Republican members. And I'll talk yeah. about that uh, in this afternoon session. Can you clarify when you session. say you, are you talking about the delegation of teachers and students who are approaching going to those edit boards? Well, when I, it was basically CNPA. It was me. Right. Um, okay. And um, some of the, uh, Steve O'Donohue um, was uh, helpful. He's, uh, you, many of you know Steve. Um, uh, Jan, uh, to some extent, but um, one of the things that we have annually uh, is a Government Affairs Day where we pair members of the legislature and publishers together. Right. And we have uh, a presentation and that kind of thing. And, and one of the features of that day, um, Tom, my colleague, Tom Newton, and I get up and we give about a five-minute presentation on all the things that we are going to do for the legislative session for that year so that the publishers know what the issues are. And we also tell them you know, who the, the members are that they need to talk to that day when they go and make their legislative appointments. And so get in front of a big group, talk about it, you know, that kind of thing. And this is one of those issues that I addressed in about a minute and a half of that five minute presentation and all of a sudden from that came an editorial from the Auburn Journal, a tiny little daily you know in the gold country in California and then somebody picked that up and they started to run an editorial and then before we even had the language of the bill there were these two editorials for the change in the law. It's like, okay. And then I, I put together a report called the Legislative Bulletin for, for all of our members where I talk about the legislation and some of the dynamics that are going on. And that's helpful. We try to get that deep into each of our members' newspapers, not only the publisher, but the editors, the managing editors, um, and try to go deep on that. So we, we're pretty, um, pretty broad in our ability to get out a message if we need to. Um, and that's helpful, too. Question, um, and, and Jim, I'd be interested in hearing from you on this also uh, because of your experiences in Illinois. Uh, my observation has been for those states who don't have a law yet uh, and are struggling hard, including Michigan, uh, that three things happen when you're dealing with state press associations. You either get an endorsement, you get opposition, or you get neutrality. Neutrality comes across as opposition. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, for example, I, uh, I know Dave Bennett, and I know you do as well. I met with Dave Bennett about a year ago, no interest at all in pushing a bill in Illinois again. And uh, he says, our publishers just can't support this. So how do you deal with that neutrality? Oh, we're not against it. 
But the fact that we're not supporting it comes across to legislators as opposition. Well, my first question to Dave would be, why? Why aren't the publishers concerned about this? In our first three or four attempts in the early 90s, they really had no interest in filing in the, in the one that was you know, almost successful in 97. They were, they were very supportive. But I thought it was interesting. You, in fact, the, the, main, the main mover for us was the Illinois Civil Liberties Union. I mean, they, they took the ball. That was their main priority that year, which I thought was interesting that you wanted, wanted them to stay, stay, well, stay out. Well, only because, <laughs> um, and it wasn't that I, I didn't want them on board. It's just that um, the ACLU in California, at least, is a lightning rod for Republicans. Just a lightning rod. Right. I mean, anything the ACLU is for, the Republicans are against. And so, um, I, I, as I said, I wanted to create some momentum. And it's not that way in every state. I mean, the ACLU may be much more respected in other areas of the country. I'm just talking about the political dynamic in California. Um, and so that's why, you know, we, we did it that no, way. But I think it is true that I don't think Dave has ever been that hot on the idea. I really don't. Well, been, he's the director of the Illinois Press Association. It, it is a reflection of education that has to happen. We're going to break into saying, but Kathy, did you have a question or comment? All I, all I would like to say is, Jim, have you ever considered like, maybe moving to the state of <laughs> 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 I have family up there. <laughs> so, so, you know, give, give, give me yeah, okay, have you have a great lobbyist up there. Roland Thompson is really effective. Yeah. One of the things that this does suggest is, and what, what part of the reason that we're doing this is, Jim is one of those people whose expertise and, and influence we intend to take full advantage right. of. And I think, you know, one of the things I'm thinking as we're talking is how can we package him, <laughs> you know, in a CD, you know, in, in a, something written that will be you, something all of you can use in, in your own um, state. Well, to, didn't to didn't help you say you were meeting all your... Can cohorts were meeting pretty soon. I mean, is this something you can push with all the other press association directors? Uh, yeah, you can well, lobby I'm, them. It, it's, <laughs> see, I'm not I'm not a manager of the association like Dave okay. or Dave Stamps or you know I'm staff. Okay. Right. Um, but I can have informal conversations with them and just sort of ask them about it. And, you know, talk to them a little bit about why we did what we did and just kind of um, feel them out that way. Um, yeah, so I, I I have to work a little bit more uh, covertly, I guess. Hmm. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little break. So if any